All right, shall we uh, have a little chatter chat? Um, so I, I am going to play an awkward dual role now of, of moderator and, uh, and, uh, and a participant in this. But we're basically going to do a sort of like a highly participatory, I hope, Q&A about, I think, AI in general. So it doesn't need to be about my talk. It doesn't need to be about Taro's talk. Um, we can also get to those questions, um, you know, if there are some. But broadly, I think this is a conversation that like, we as a group of people should be having. Uh, and we've invented, <laughs> invented <laughs> invited uh, Stephanie here uh, because she has been working on some really exciting, interesting art projects. Um, and Tero also has been working on you know, just experimenting with AI and music. So before we get into audience questions, could I just ask each of you, like, how do you feel about all of this? Like, how do we feel about AI? Well. My, most of my time spent looking into this is kind of in the context of, of music because that's where I spend, spend much of my attention. I suppose I kind of see two parallel narratives, main narratives going on there. There's, there's a narrative of empowerment, which is very much what you were talking about here as well, which is like more people will have more access to making, making music and you can have tools that let you have ideas you couldn't have otherwise. And you can kind of just extend, extend the reach of human expression with these tools. The other narrative is the kind of replacement narrative, which is more like there will be tools for musicians, but will there also be tools for the kind of worst aspects of predatory capitalism to kind of just centralize more and more wealth and power to fewer and fewer people, um, which both of these kind of can be seen occurring. And I love what you said at the end there, which was um, also relates to my personal reflection about this, which is that like we work in tech, like we are actually the people who uh, have kind of a lot of say in what kinds of narratives get furthered uh, in AI, like what actually happens. And that's why it's, it's a legitimate question to ask ourselves quite often just, you know, are we the baddies? <laughs> you know, um, like what is it that we our work? Who is it for? Whose interests does it serve? Is it the people who make things or the people who don't? Um, and obviously, it's it's hard to take a very principled stance on this because it's also kind of precarious potentially for us. What's happening? Like we we need to get work where we can quite often. Um, and these same narrative of narratives of potential replacement also play into software development, I think, because you, we don't know where it's going. And, and I, I think I'm probably not the only one who's, because we are all front-end developers, or most of us, and we, we kind of have this built-in drive to kind of keep up with technology as it emerges, because it does all the time in the front-end. We kind of have to spend so much time and energy figuring out what are the things we should invest our time in to stay relevant, basically. And this year with LLMs, there's been this kind of, it seems like it's kicked to another gear completely, which is like, is there going to be something that actually makes lots of the thing, things I spend time on uh, going to be worth nothing at some point because there's a paradigm shift in how software gets made. Um, and I switch between this optimist and pessimist kind of mindsets sometimes within one minute uh, when I think about these things and I think I generally am optimistic about how things are probably going to happen like in general like th there's going to be probably more good things than, than bad things that are going to happen but it's by by no means is that obvious or or kind of given that it will happen and that's why it matters what we do Um, so my background is that I've used machine learning and AI for just like in a hobbyist sense for making uh, hardware and art projects. And I also, I work at GitHub. I don't work on Copilot, but I do use Copilot. And so I, yeah, I can see the benefit of that. And yeah, when the, I also on Twitter, uh, seeing just the hype train a few months ago for ChatGPT, <sighs> and people making very broad statements about we don't need front-end front end engineers like myself anymore. Uh, 
it's a bit worrying when you haven't actually, I don't know, played around with it and you feel like behind. And I don't really have that worry anymore since I've started using it. And I see it more as like at this maturity level, like more as like a coding buddy. Um, I've, yeah, it's written some terrible SQL queries for me. It's been better at like reviewing my text and or to sometimes I struggle to start writing something, but I don't really have a fear now that I've played with it. Um, I do think it's interesting in um, like in an artistic sense, and then also as a neurodivergent person, I can really see the benefit, especially like if you're making kind of a hardware like um, maybe like a companion. Like this could be really powerful for autistic and other neurodivergent people. Um, n not saying to replace human interaction, but as a safe space to practice it. Uh, I'm quite interested in that. Um, I, yeah, I'm optimistic, but uh, yeah, there's a lot of ethical concerns. Um, yeah, because there's still, there's a lot of people behind it that are pow powering it still. It's not powering itself, and it's still relying on human crea creativity. And so I just don't see it as something to replace our creativity anytime soon. No, I think the replacement narrative is interesting. And, and uh, we have a question here, which we'll get to in a bit, which is, will AI allow designers to build any UI and make front-end developers obsolete? You know, this is a question that we'll get to in a bit. But I think you know, the whole replacement narrative is interesting because you know, I think it's in the best interest of you know, the people who make these you know, AI companies, uh, AI tools that are funded by very large tech companies um, to essentially promote this sort of like a narrative of like, no, everything's going to be just fine. This will just like improve, you know, human creativity, improve your productivity as a developer, you know, make you faster or whatever. <clears throat> but if you look at like the real logic of the marketplace, like if there is, you know, going to be tough economic times ahead, you know, in the consumer side, you know, people who buy the software, that means the companies are going to struggle to maintain budgets. And then suddenly we have this magic tool that will make companies actually do more with less. Mm -hmm. So the idea here, the, the, the optimistic case that is being presented by companies like OpenAI and Google and Microsoft is, uh, is, is uh, oh, but now you can do more with less. But I honestly don't think it's going to happen at an individual level. I think it's going to be an organizational level. You know, companies can do more with fewer mm -hmm. people. And then that will, you know, if you're from a systems thinking perspective, you start to kind of like follow the loop. That doesn't lead anywhere good. So I am definitely worried, I think, about the replacement narrative. But again, like, I hope that there will be some levers, you know, both like institutional and, and, and sort of, um, I don't know, governmental mm -hmm. um, that we can, we can apply here. But going to this question then, like, will AI allow designers to build any UI and make front-end developers obsolete? Do we have any thoughts about this? I mean, I, I don't feel like it's there. Mm. And I think it's good for prototyping, but are you, like, really to, yeah, I don't see it. I don't know. I don't mm. see it, like, replacing front-end designer or front-end developers anytime soon. A great thing is great for prototyping, but production code, mm. I'm a bit skeptical mm. that you would trust that with yeah. your users and user data. Mm. Um, yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, I have a similar, similar stance on that. I think currently, definitely not. I mean, it's, it's not there, but to say whether it will get there at some, some days is a much tougher question. And I, what I wonder about as well is that there's really been a kind of curve of higher and higher productivity anyway across the last decades of what we can do with computers. And as, as that gets higher and higher, productivity gets higher and higher, our imagination kind of uh, gets higher and higher as well. We do more ambitious things with computers. And I do wonder if, if that will save us in the end, which is that we, yes, we will have machines that can solve the problems that we are now solving in an automated fashion, but we'll come up with new problems that are mm. harder, which they can't solve. And, and then we still have things to do. Yeah, I think we all, like as developers, I think we all suffer from a little bit of this poverty of imagination, myself very much included, I'm counting myself in this, where when we look at something like Copilot or JetGPT or even like uh, GitHub, uh, 
whatever the, the chat interface for Copilot. Like these are, you know, like they're getting better and better, but we kind of see like, okay, soonly, you know, surely eventually that won't, you know, get good enough to actually be able to write production grade code. But I, I think that it will. This is the problem. And I don't think it necessarily will get that good by just making the model smarter or feeding it more data or having a better algorithm, but like instrumenting them differently. Like mm -hmm. for example, when we talk about in this question, will AI allow a designer to build any UI? Let's mm -hmm. say that design isn't just a Figma file, but let's say that design is also a set of requirements yeah. that looks like a cucumber test. You know, like this software should do this and this and this mm -hmm. and this. And then you just let an agent of AI run on it until it passes all the tests and mm -hmm. uh, you know, then you have a functioning system. Now that will lead into very different kind of software that won't be maintainable by humans, won't be you know, necessarily understandable by humans, but maybe that's not how software will be built anyway. Maybe it will happen at the level of design and, and, and instruction and requirements. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm not trying to be pessimistic about this, but I, I think that's basically where we're headed. My concern is mm. that, uh, <laughs> like, Chat GPT, maybe I just don't know how to do prompt engineering, mm. but it's so, I cannot use it for, I'm impressed with the writing application mm. because I feel it sounds so like HR speak and so mechanical and if, if everyone is using this to build designs to production and it's just gonna be apps for a AI generated idea of what mm. humans want, I, I don't know, I don't really, no, I, I don't think that's what I mean. I don't mean that the AI will design the app. I mean, maybe that will also, like some parts of the design process, you know, the detail-oriented part of it will probably become much improved or make it easier by, by AI. What I mean is that, uh, you know, like if you look at the act of building software, you know, it's, it's the trying to provide a functionality to a user or business or, or whatever, and then it's writing a whole lot of code that nobody really, you know, fundamentally cares about. Like from a business point of view, that code is a cost. Um, it's, you know, for us it's a joy, we love writing mm -hmm. it. Um, but, you know, for, for, the, for the business it's, uh, it's just a hindrance of, of, of getting to the end goal, whatever. So I think the design, the decisions, you know, like that will be the creative part, that's the part the humans will do. And I think the coding part will be the part that we will exceedingly, like, you know, increasingly make the machines do for us or with us, maybe collaboratively. Um, yeah, I see it more as a collaborative process mm. because there's just mm -hmm. so many concerns with the UI, especially like accessibility. I, yeah, mm. I just, I don't, I, and it, it'll be interesting if this is the case and mm. then like actual like end-to-end uh, -end human design encoded website would be more like bespoke experience. Mm. <laughs> that Artisanal. would be yeah. interesting dystopic yeah. kind of, I, I don't know, situation mm. um, because yeah, I, I don't know. I always think of things because I, 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 yeah, I have my day job, but I, my, I make my hobby projects. And I, if it doesn't have like whimsy and everything starts to look the same, mm -hmm. I, I'm bored. Mm. That's what yeah. I worry about. Yeah, you see this with models like Mid Journey as well, which kind of um, everything kind of has the aesthetic of kind of Mid Journey fight aesthetic of like homogenized kitsch. So it all like, looks like things you would buy in a head shop. That is kind of a picture of a fairy or something. That kind of the, there's so much of the aesthetic that is coded into the model that there's mm. not as much that you can do as a crea creator because there's mm. only so much you can express in words when you are not uh, in a, especially when you're working with media that is not uh, verbal to begin with, like mm. visuals or music. Um, but if we think about code. Does it matter what the code looks like? Does it matter that it? Oh, it doesn't matter if no one ever needs to look at it. Yeah, like exactly. if a tree falls, you know. Mm, exactly. Yeah. yeah, it's almost like uh, the binary. You know, it's the, the output. Exactly. You know, it's the uh, it's the compilation target. Yeah. Um, yeah. I have a question for you. Yeah. So you, uh, we're talking about AI generating code. What mm. about AI maintaining the code? Yeah, I mean that that's really interesting, right? Like I think maintenance overall, you know. Taking a piece of code that is functioning or not functioning and then you know, changing it in order to get it to do what you want, I think is the most difficult part of software engineering. Um, I think the way that, you know, if, if I was trying to figure out like how do we get to a point where uh, uh, an AI model can actually do that part, it, would, it wouldn't do it. It would just rewrite the code from scratch every time as long as the requirements are essentially expressed in a way that you know, it, it can test against you know, the existing behavior or the regress 
uh, until it gets mm -hmm. to a result where it does the thing that it did except with the change that you want to make. Mm -hmm. um, which is interesting. Again, like it makes the code sort of again like a, a byproduct. It's um, mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, obviously, we're a long way from there, and I think this is what I you know I'm, I'm kind of trying to challenge. I think all of us uh, not to think too small because it is true that the current tools like ChatGPT and and Copilot just are nowhere near that. Yeah. Um, but I think we sort of like as engineers need to think a little bit about what do how do we actually make ourselves not only like future proof, but like how do we how do we ensure that we still keep creating great software for users uh, when there will be massive economic pressure for us to be using tools like this? Mm -hmm. um, anyway, that gets real heavy. Should we take some listener questions? Sure. Um, so I actually launched a little poll. Um, you know, we have a small sample size of people here, but I've asked, uh, have you used AI tools like Copilot or ChatGPT in your work as a developer? Um, 20% said yes a lot, 60% uh, said yes a little, and 20% said, you know, uh, no, mm -hmm. they haven't at all. Yeah. Um, what do you sort of think is, um, is sort of like when you've been, you know, playing play with Copilot, for example, like what is a good mm -hmm. way to get started? This is a question that we have over here is like, how, how do, you know, how, how do you become, become, begin exploring, you know, whether for creative works or coding or, Anything else? Like, what, how did you get started? How do, how do you make use of these tools? Well, with Copilot, I just installed it early on. <laughs> and, you know, I am not a person who th like, thinks, makes a great plan of I'm going to use this tool this way, and mm. that's going to be my thing. I just started to engage with it as an autocomplete first. It wasn't very good at first, mm. but as, as you probably saw me use it today as well, it's like, it's all, now it's like just part of my process as, as it write some of the code, then I just quickly scan it and see if it's correct and just go forward. It's a, I maybe do f at least 50% less typing now than I used mm. to. And it's more on that level. I'm still, I think, doing the thinking most of the time, hopefully. Um, but it's things like not having to carry around in my head things like how a certain API works, like some like bureaucracy that comes into developing certain things. And just using the machine as a kind of second brain to kind of hold details, trivia like that, that I don't really care about. Um, that's, that's where it helps me a lot. Um, but this isn't something I just, you know, decided to use it for. It's just something I've noticed that happens when I used it, and it's very much like a natural thing. And that's, I think, um, due to the... It, it works in a way that, you, that really kind of slips into your workflow really easily, so you don't really have to think about it. It's just mm -hmm. like there. It's very immediate, kind of like Max, where I would like, really like to have Copilot for Max as well, by the way, mm. but someone needs to make that for me. <laughs> Did you say 50% time less about, was that? Probably at least mm. half of my typing is now done by the Copilot. And does it help you stay in the flow of the thing that you're doing? Sure, yeah. yeah. Well, I don't know. I mean, it, it, yes and no. I mean, I used to think that doing repetitive tasks like typing some boring code Let's, gives me time to actually solve problems in my subconscious at the same time. Mm. I used to think that. I don't know if I, because I've lost that now pretty much because there's, it, it'll happen so much more immediately. I no longer have that time. Mm. And that's maybe, I don't know what the net result of that is. Is it better or worse? Mm. Uh, but it feels like when I need to take a thinking break, I need to explicitly do that now. It used to happen more naturally when I, there was some like really boring, uh, coding tasks to do that I really didn't have to engage with with my prefrontal cortex so much. Mm. And Stephanie, you've done all these cool AI projects. Like, how do you how do how do you think of things to, you know, sort of engage with AI with? Um, well, the project I'm going to talk about tomorrow. Mm. Um, that's the first time I actually use kind of like more AI, where it's like, like doing generative because I use ChatGPT. Most of the time, I've just incorporated the machine learning models for doing like classification. So I've built like a necklace that would know since how many people were around me, it was LED necklace and then it would change programs and colors based on how many people were around me. I, and um, most of these projects are on like a Raspberry Pi and using TensorFlow. And also during COVID, I had a crow that would come to my window and get peanuts. And I built this whole thing to 
train the model as he would come and take pictures and tweet of him. Um, so, I mean, it's less, it's more like the machine learning classification than actual generating content. Um, and, yeah. Um, so it, it's, it's less about AI, I guess, mm. is my experience. I mean, I, I use Copilot at work. It's good for repetitive things. I'm bad at remembering, like, my curly boys and <laughs> parentheses and everything. Yep. And for, like, writing new, new code is good. It doesn't help me so much for debugging things. Um, um, yeah, so I, I still, like, I'm... I'm just a bit more skeptical, mm. and I see it as like a buddy, but not like the best coding partner. I have used ChatGP to help me get started on SQL queries because I'm terrible at SQL queries. Mm. It wrote some bad SQL, then I had to figure out how to write better SQL mm. myself, um, or explaining how how things work in React or like um, fundamental mm. things. I do find I see it just more as a buddy mm. than relying on it. I would not rely on it. Yeah, I think a lot of those things are also, you know, in, in my talk, you know, one of the rules was, you know, like to bring things in context, but also like, you know, make sure that it's aware of all of the, you know, conventions and, you know, that the mm -hmm. types of, you know, code and data you have in your project. Yeah. Like Copilot doesn't unfortunately do that. And we have a question here, actually. I don't know if any of us can answer it. Uh, are there AI tools like Copilot that you could teach with your own company source code and have the model locally in case a company forbids online AI tools, like something that is only, a, bespoke AI for you. Um, I haven't heard of anything that's on the market yet, but have you heard anything? I mean, I think I've heard about things like, what is the thing from Meta Lambda or something like that? Oh, yes. That, that you know, is a smaller model that you could fine tune with your own company data and run on, on premises or on your, on your own laptop. But, but I have never tried any of those models, so I don't have any, any real insight. But I, mm. I, I, I I think they are there. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, yeah, that's not a very good answer, but you know. Uh, yeah, I Miss mean, Stephanie, I know that you don't work on Copilot and GitHub, but I will just, you know, use you as a, a personification of GitHub for the purposes. I would be <laughs> really disappointed on GitHub if within a year there wasn't a GitHub enterprise sort of like a on-prem, you know, type of model that you can do exactly, you know, for this thing. You can, you know, take, I'll take, take the feedback. Take, yeah, take, <laughs> take, take, take it back. Yes, uh, that one guy would be really disappointed if if this wasn't. There. No, but I think this is this is something where we are in right now. Like the the just the access of these base technologies is so new, and I think it just takes organizations, you know, like this hardware limitations, which don't have enough GPUs currently, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So it's going to take a while for you know these companies to build out the tools. But I am one hundred percent sure that these tools are coming. So that you know, like solves for the company problem of not wanting to actually give your source code to OpenAI or Microsoft, which totally makes sense. Although you already give your source code to GitHub, so I don't know, um, you know, what the difference there really is. Um, but yeah, I think the, 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 this, you know, like looking at where we are right now, projecting sort of like six to 12 months ahead, I think uh, the landscape look, will look very different. Mm -hmm. um, but then there are some questions here which are, you know, less sort of, less overcomable by just like engineering. Um, you know, we have seen various AI models being biased about certain things, you know, like mm -hmm. stereotypes, racism. Um, the question here was particularly about my talk, which is will those biases creep into literature using AI? And I can't answer that, but just generally, like how do you sort of view, you know, do, do you think it's possible um, that we are sort of like creating a sort of like a biased hell machine over here, or, or is that like a high on your list of concerns? Well, it is, yeah, I mean, and there is bias in, in any mm. technology. It's, it's there, so for example, taking an example from, from music, mm. most music models that are trained on, say, like MIDI information, like notes mm. and things like that, they assume that every, all, all music is um, notatable in Western conventions, which most music in the world actually isn't. So it's right there in the, in, the, in the design of the data set and how the data is represented in the data set where you start losing certain aspects of it. You kind of force it into a mold that assumes certain things, and there's, then there's nothing that the machine learning could do to get, up, get away from those biases because they are there in how you format the data set. 
and I think these examples, you can find them any, anywhere. You make certain design choices when you um, choose how to represent data, and that always leaves out something, and you need to kind of try to be aware of what it is that you are not modeling and how you're modeling those things that you are including. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with that. And just, um, I think a lot of times in tech, we want to move so fast that we don't slow down for these things. And this is what mm. really concerns me. And that we forget that there's this whole team of actual human individuals that are doing content moderation that are not, haven't been treated necessarily the best. And um, the things that they have to see and moderate are not pleasant. And we, I think so quickly, we get so excited about what this can do for us, we forget about there's still this huge human back end to it. And there's people being exploited and, and er erasing of things that don't fit in with the model. And this is my, big concern about yeah moving too quickly with these things like it just moves too quickly and then we're already so far there we're not going to mm -hmm. go back and think about these things yeah I, I definitely agree and I think you know I, I, I refer to the moral gray area you know and this is something I struggle with personally a lot right like on one hand we're building this tool um, you know to, to try to do something fun and creative and like help people um, but at the same time you know like you can't really externalize all of those sort of like you can't ignore all of those negative exter externalities right Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, my hope would be that we can sort of, as an industry, you know, create these sort of like ethically sourced, um, you know, sort of like models, not only from a data sort of like constant perspective, but also like the human, you know, like the, you know, RHLF, you know, trainers who are actually like having to label this data mm -hmm. that they are trade, treated, trade fairly and fairly and uh, pride, uh, paid fairly. Yeah. Um, and I think maybe, you know, we're, we're kind of over time, but there's this one question, and this is going to be a little hard, but maybe it's more of a conversation rather than a simple answer. Um, how can we build AI within ethical frameworks? How do we know what is ethical? AI is driven by efficiency and saving money or time to make more revenue for companies. Mm -hmm. Like, which absolutely whoever wrote that anonymous, you know, agree. I think this is my biggest sort of like fear of like, I've, you know, any of these technological advancements that happen, if they happened in a, in a different universe where we had sorted out some of our sort of like societal you know, issues and basically capitalism. Uh, I think, you know, we, it would be so exciting to look mm -hmm. at the productive potential of improving human quality of life. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, at the bottom of the bathtub, there is a big hole and all of the, not only money, but, uh, but, but the value created is, is, you know, flowing out of it into, you know, essentially the system that people don't benefit from it. So going back mm -hmm. to the question is like, have you thought about like, what is your personal stance? How can we build, you know, use AI in our lives within like an ethical framework? Hard question, I know. Really hard, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'll just, I think my answer is short. I don't know if we can. Mm. Mm. Uh, I don't know, I see it as kind of like a fun hobby thing. Let's see what, I like to see kind of what weird things it can do. Mm. Um, but I'm generally more interested in like the classification, machine learning mm. aspects of it. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, it'd be great if you all had a base income mm. and we could just explore artistic mm -hmm. projects with mm. it, but yeah, I, I'm just not sure. Yeah. No, me neither. Uh, you have to kind of, I feel like you have to kind of trust that you can also just make a difference by choosing what you decide to work on. Mm. Like this. It's not given that things will go a certain way. I mean, there are powerful forces of capitalism mm -hmm. that, that are pushing things in certain direction, but but even within that great kind of mega trend, there's a lot of different directions that things could go in. And you know, we we make the AI. Like well, mm. not all of us personally actually train AI models, but we are in tech. So we are kind of in this group that people that are not in tech will, they see us as the people who make make these choices actually. So mm. Uh, we might as well own that and stop making some choices, you know. Uh, it's, um, and it is not easy because we need to make a living as well. Uh, so you know, can't just say, I'm not going to work on anything that might at some point be questionable. Uh, so it's, that's what makes it hard for me. I mean, it's, yeah. 
I mean, opting out is, is of course, like, you know, hard because, you know, you put your principles ahead of practicality, mm -hmm. but it'll also get harder in the sense that, like, these, you know, technologies will be baked into all of the software that we use, whether we want it or not. Mm -hmm. You know, there's now Microsoft Windows Copilot, there's Office Copilot soon, so anybody mm -hmm. who works on a, on a text document or Microsoft Excel, whatever, is, you know, using implicitly these models. And, yeah, I'm sure there's going to be some toggle to go turn the, the feature off, mm -hmm. but at what point are you then just making it like very difficult for you to do things that are going to be easy for other people and like what is the actual benefit of making the choice and this is the kind of like pragmatic applied you know ethics that you know I don't have a per good answer for me in my life in general I constantly do things that are in the gray area just because yeah. it's it's really hard to in every moment to know you know where to draw the line yeah. but I think you know maybe we'll uh, you know, if, if you want to have last words on 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 your side, uh, I will I will give you the mic. But I think my last word on this is is personally that it's the same as with everything. You know, we can't fix capitalism, but we can act locally. Like I gave the example of not building features that enable sort of like a, or you know sort of like a like you know theft at en masse, for example. And like I think all of us can make those you know small pragmatic choices. And then if some, somebody wants to make a choice of like living a Luddite Lud life and, and, and not use any of this technology, that's personally fine as well. But I don't know if I'm able to, if I have the moral courage or even actually the moral imperative to, to, to make that choice for myself. Mm -hmm. um, anything else? I think you said it. Mm. All right, well, this was a much heavier session than I <laughs> expected it to be, uh, but maybe this is... This is where we are getting. We're living in, in dark times, people. Um, and on that note, I think it's time for the first after party. Um, there were tons of questions here that were about my talk and about Teros' talk. Uh, we decided to focus on these things now. But both of us will be here tomorrow. So be, please do tug us from the sleeve and ask all of the questions that you wanted. And tell me where I'm wrong and you know morally reprehensible. I, I would love to hear that, especially at the after party with a couple of drinks in hand. <laughs> um, so, uh, Tuli, do you want to wrap up the day, or should I wrap it up from here? It's a wrap, people. Uh, see you tomorrow. Thank, Thank you. you.